So now I'm in Mohawk box. I have 180 days to do. And I'm just waiting my turn to go to Southport. But while I'm in Mohawk box, I seem to be there longer than usual. They're holding me. Nobody really stays there for longer than 30 days. And here I am, 90 days in and I'm still there. I start to catch on with the politics of how, of what they were doing to keep inmates and gang affiliates on the inside. They didn't want to release them to the street. So they were doing everything they can to hold you there. So they knew that I was going to my parole board soon. And they wanted to hold me there. They wanted to see me. They wanted for me to see the parole board at Mohawk Correctional Facility, where there had just been a, pri a prior riot. And rumor has it that an inmate had died at the hands of correction officers in the box only months prior to that. So now I'm in Mohawk box, overstaying my welcome, and I start becoming a box engineer. I be having neighbors here and there because they come in a week, two weeks, 30 days, and they leave. So I started to pick up things, little tricks, of how to survive the box. And one of the first tricks that everybody picks up is fishing. If you want it, at that time, there were cigarettes and things of that nature that was going around in the box as well. Uh, matches, you can get matches in there. And when you go fishing, you basically set up a line where you can tap and send all the way down to the next cell and you can trade things with your cell neighbor, like books, magazines, periodicals, cigarettes, etc., letters, photos. That's your only means of communicating with your cell mate next to you. Now, this story predates the five points box facility. Later on, that facility was made specifically for gang members so that they can leave Southport Correctional Facility alone and let the old timers that had life and was there for dangerous natures, let them do their bid there alone, away from the gang fuckery. But that didn't work. But let's get back to Mohawk. You start, one of the first things you start to learn is the fishing. So with that is you can get little straps or little pieces of, of uh, blankets or sheets where you can just tie to your pen, stick it out of your shell because you only have about maybe like an inch and a half or so, so that you can hit it with your pen. The end of the uh, toothbrush rather you hit the toothbrush with your pen and you send it all the way down. Yeah, now they'll bring in the line. Yeah, send me those cigarettes. And then he does it back. Then you wheel it in. That's the first thing that everybody should know when they're in the box. Uh, once you're in the box, you know, you start to earn your little privileges. So after 30 days, you, you get to go to the store. If you're there longer than 30 days, you get to go to the store and you can get things like Vaseline and, and and soap and toiletries and things of that nature. So you use those things also. Um, I had this thing where I used to take the little fold up of the sheet. You look at the little fold up, the little lip, there's always a little stitching there. So I would take my comb and hit it with the stitching and little by little, it takes a long time, but when you're in the box, that's all you have is time. So you start to kind of weave backwards. You teach yourself how to weave backwards. So you take out the little stitching and before you know it, you got a line so long and it's invisible. And when you hit it, you know, the cops all the way down there, which is watching, which sometimes if they want to be jerks, they'll just make a round on the block and they'll just start snatching everybody's lines. Like, yeah, ah, y'all guys ain't doing nothing today. And on top of that, if you get caught ripping those sheets, that's an extra offense. 
and the fence started adding up. And, they, and there's been people that really don't care and they'll just keep adding on time and adding on time. So with this weaving new technology that I've acquired in the box, I start to get really long strings. So I start to shoot my line farther and farther. So I used to get things, you know, magazines, the usual stuff and food. Uh, and talking about food, there's another way that you survive with food also because food is really scarce in the box. So one of the first things that's suggested is if when you get your meals, you take your bread and you take the edges off. And when you take the edges off, you consume that with your meal. The rest of the bread you want to save for the nighttime. You can go and go to the refrigerator and go get those munchies or go down to the corner store and go get you a pack of donuts and a, and a quarter water. You can't do that when you're in the box. So you always want to save your bread because I'm gonna tell you why. When all said and done and it's time to go to sleep, that stomach gonna be talking to you. Yeah, it's gonna be telling you things. So what you wanna do is you wanna take that bread and you wanna smash it up into a little ball, a little compact ball. You have enough of them, you have maybe two or three, maybe even four. And you take those little bread balls and you swallow them and you chase it down with water. And when that bread is in your stomach and the water hits it, it expands. And when it expands, you can sleep comfortably. Another thing also that's very important is what you put in your head when you're in the box. Mind you, I'm talking to, I'm talking from an era where you actually had peace and quiet in the box. Not when you was double bunked with a cellmate where you could sit down and play Uno or cards with some made up, drawn out cards on paper. I don't know if that's a thing, but that's what I would do. I would take a whole bunch of papers, draw cards, and we could make shift cards. If I was in the box, which I was never locked in the box with a cellmate. But what you put in your mind, in your head, is very important because that's going to stay in there. I say that because instead of getting the Word Up magazines and the sources and the vibes, I used to read a lot of encyclopedias that they had all the way in the bottom of the little rolling library that comes by every couple of days where you have to swap a book for a book or a magazine for a magazine. I had to sell all the way in the end. So the good stuff was not reaching me, the good magazines and things of that nature. So I used to settle for encyclopedias. And the little bit of magazines that were reaching me were magazines of nature hunting, kayaking, rock climbing, wind gliding. This was what I was fitting, filling in my head so that I can pass time. I was projecting myself into these magazines and becoming what I was reading. I was reading about an adventure. I'll be on the adventure. I was reading about hunting. Uh, a, lot, a lot of things too. The Kabbalah magazines had all these apparels, all these different camouflage and different things. That stuff I gravitated to. And later on, it will become some sort of activity or hobby for me. A lifetime one. So it's very important what you put in your head when you're in the hole. Because that stuff stays with you. Violence, gang periodicals, all of that stuff is drilled into your head. It's what you become. You have to be very careful what you put in there when you're in the midst of, of solitude. And back then, this was real solitude. It was no yelling and 
and, 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 and yelling out across because the cops had that on lock, especially Mohawk, where the word was out that an inmate had just died at the hands of a cop. It was real strict in there. You could barely scream, you could barely yell, you could barely talk. They, um, they will come at you with malice intentions using externals to tell you a lot about something is something that will also gravitate to and develop later on also as far as like um, animals. When you're in a hole and you're looking out windows, you know, you do see animals and, and you learn from them. You know, like the robins, when they sit on the ground, you know it's gonna rain, right? They pull out the worms from the ground. So you know it's gonna rain. Uh, when you see the hawk, you know you can pretty much see wind speed. You know when the wind direction is coming, things of that nature. So the animals tell you a lot. I remember having a, a little crack in my cell floor and in it were ants. And every day I would come and I would put like little pieces of food and watch this colony of ants rise from the floor crawl up across, grab the food and go back. This is when I start learning about pheromone. And, and, and when you erase that or you clean or you wipe the surface of what the ant is following in order to get to the food that is attracting them, they need that pheromone. So if you wipe it, it's not there, they go crazy. They going around, they done, it's like they forgot where the food was at and it's right in front of them. So they following the pheromone, they're not really using sight or, or, or sound. They following the pheromone, the smell. Later on as a hunter, I would use pheromone to trap my prey. And uh, yeah. Everything was going well in the box. I was overstaying, I was getting suspicious. I already knew what was going on. They wanted to keep me. They wanted me to see the parole board. Until one time, an individual had went down to the visit. And in the visit, he tried to score a contraband object. Something that was not allowed in the facility. And for some reason, the officers were dead positive that this individual was carrying, and so he got put on shit patrol. The shit patrol is when you go into the hole, express, and you have a, a police officer sitting in front of your cell, watching for your bowel movements. Before you get to that cell, they will shut down the water, the sink and the toilet. And at times, they will even put a cover over it so that you have no access to the toilet. So that when you have to shit, they'll give you a, a little portable bucket, like a potty. You have to shit in that potty. And when you shit, you have to provide that sample because they're gonna go through it to make sure of what it is that you have in you. So somebody got caught bringing something in. But by law, you are required, but only so much to go on without food, eating, drinking, and the shit patrol because it's inhumane. So what everybody wants to do is, I believe it's five days or four days or something, or three to five days where they have for you to provide that sample. And some people protest and they try to wait it out. Well, sooner or later, you're gonna crack. You're gonna eat food, you're gonna drink liquids, and you're gonna shit. So they knew that. So what they did was something that was so out of the ordinary 
that looking at it now, it was the most illegal thing that anybody could ever do while you're in the hole from the Department of Corrections. And that is poison my food. Not only my food, but the COs went and put laxative not only in the food, but in the juice and fed it to the entire wing. I have this diarrhea one day, two days, three days. I'm hearing complaints. I'm hearing the people saying the same thing. And people who's going to sick call, and all sick call does, yo, this is what they do when you complain of diarrhea and sick call. I can't make this shit up. They'll bring ices, an icy. It's like ice. And it's like a grape flavor. And it has like this, like this shape that's like a rectangular icy shape. And they'll bring you about six or seven of those. And some apple juice. And that's how they treat severe diarrhea. In the hole. They put you on a liquid diet. So when they was doing this, I was like, man, I know something ain't right, man. So I had to write home. So that somebody can call Albany. And let them know that somebody is being poisoned in the hole. And so I write my letter. And I wrote it to a good friend of mine. He gets the letter. He did exactly what I asked of him. He contacted somebody. Gave up my information. They came and they got my first thing in the morning. My ass up out of there. I never knew what happened to the person that was in question there. If we ever drank from the juice or if we ever ate or if we ever succumbed to the time period that they had set. But I know one thing's 100% fact. That they poisoned everybody's food. Everybody. I don't know what they expected to, I don't know what they wanted to achieve by that. But I don't know how they could have swept that under the rug when everybody's complaining about having diarrhea. In that wing. So finally, they come to my cell, they crack it open, sketch your stuff together, you're leaving. And here I am, on my way to Southport, with like maybe three months or so to go see the parole. We take this up on the next video. Thank you for watching.